Yeah, I, I now focus 95% on investors and my thing is buy something 60s, 70s, 80s with value add potential. So something that can be renovated so you can increase your equity and something that can be subdivided. Not everyone subdivides. It's only a small you know, number of people that want to go down that path because you need the cash, take some time. Some people think it's stressful. I, I help them with that, but some people still don't want to do it. But I still like to buy properties that can be renovated. At value. 100%. Welcome to the Buyers Agent Institute show. The purpose of the show is to bring awareness to buyers agents, to bring awareness around the career opportunities that the buyers agent sector is providing to people, to bring awareness around the value that buyers agents are providing to people who need help buying property. Our goal is to strip back and dive into the remarkable journeys of buyers agents who are paving the way forward in one of the fastest growing career sectors in Australia right now. Our guest today is Oliver Jackson. Ollie comes all the way from Melbourne, He's currently running his buyer's agent business called Living Property. He's got a very colorful background. He's worked in three different industries. He's worked in hospitality, he's worked in fitness, and he's worked in construction, and he's owned businesses within these sectors, or some of these sectors before. So he's got an understanding of what it's like to be an employee and a business owner. And while he was doing all of this, he built a portfolio. He built a portfolio worth around $3 million, so he's got a knack for investing, and he's also renovated properties himself. So he really gets in deep with what he does with his property investing for his clients. Ollie's now buying on a national level across different states, and I'm really excited to dive into his story because, he, as I said, he's got a very colorful story. So today, I'd like to introduce Oliver Jackson. Welcome, mate. Thanks for having me, buddy. Good to have you here. Cheers. It's good to be here. I remember when we first spoke, you were, I believe, driving. I was driving. I think you were, you were working construction, so you were driving from near the Mornington. Mornington Peninsula, yep. Into the city. So it was obviously probably, what is it, a one and a half, two hour commute? Yeah, two and a half hours every day, both ways, yeah. I mean, that, that must be, I mean, how did you, I mean, I know you, your education, you like it, so you would have been listening to podcasts and doing like reading, listening to audios and stuff. But that commute, I always think about when I'm driving out of the city and I see people stuck in traffic, I was like, doing that every day? Like, did that, was that, was that a, tr a trouble for you? Drove me insane. <laughs> It was um, 45 because I was in construction, so it was a 6.30 start. So, you know, you're, you're 45 minutes on the way to work, not too bad. Sometimes two and a half hours on the way home. I mean, you can, you can listen to 100 podcasts a week or, you know, do two or three audio books a week, which is great, but, you know, you don't want to be sitting in traffic so you can read a book. <laughs> you know, I'd rather be at home sitting on the couch reading a book. So, yeah, it was after about three or four years, mate, it got, yeah, it was pretty torturous, to be honest. And you got two twins? Yeah, I got three year old twins, boy and a girl. So, yeah, very cute. So, I'm sure you'd prefer to be spending time with them, which you do now, right? 100%, mate. I'd rather you're sitting in traffic, driving home for two and a half hours, thinking about your kids when you get home. But by the time you get there, after a long day of work and then a whole day, uh, two and a half hours of driving, you get home and you're like, oh, <laughs> drained. I've just noticed you're wearing Quit the Nine to Five t shirt. Yeah. Respect. I'm not wearing mine. Mine's be kind, but I guess they're both good t shirts. <laughs> Digressing for a sec then. <laughs> so one thing I didn't mention, I said you'd worked in construction. Mm -hmm. We're obviously getting paid a really large salary. Yep. You've run your own business in hospitality and also fitness. But you've, you also have worked in the circus. Yeah, I grew up in a circus when I was a kid. Um, it's like my second family. So we, I grew up in Canberra, but traveled with the circus pretty much up until the age of 18, 19. Um, yeah, pretty different. Awesome childhood. Um, I still go to the circus regularly and yes, yeah, still family. What was your role in the circus? Uh, I was a clown, <laughs> seriously. Uh, acrobats, a uh, bit of juggling. Used to do the flying trapeze and stuff, but not, not in the show. I, was, I wasn't that good. Should we do some juggling now? Yeah, well, let's go. <laughs> Maybe not for now, but I'm, I'm assuming you're still quite yes, good. Yes, 100%. Cool. So it's interesting. A lot of the discussions I have with people on, on this show they've transitioned from a lot of the, a lot of the careers there's been some level of unfulfillment some haven't some have actually enjoyed what they're doing but i know your last role was in construction and you're obviously commuting a lot it seemed like you were underground so what were you doing in construction um so i worked in high-rise construction so cfmeu union work i was a fencer so i used to build fences um a lot of 
car park underground work. So in a car park, 12 hours a day. I mean, I was making 250 to 320 grand a year. So pretty good money, obviously. Pretty hard to leave. Uh, that's why the, every construction worker in, in Melbourne, it does it for 30 years because where else can someone go and make 300 grand a year to work in a construction site, you know? So it, it is pretty hard to leave that, that kind of grind when you're making that kind of money. But um, yeah, I'm glad I'm out of there. <laughs> Not much sunlight. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, it must be tough conditions being underground like that all day. Yeah, mate, it is. It's a different vibe, that's for sure. You're in, you know, fluoro lights, concrete, construction workers, 12 hours a day. Even 12 hours a day in any building or any job's hard enough, let alone on a half-finished building when it's freezing cold in Melbourne in winter. Yeah, it's pretty taxing. This may be a generalisation, so I, I, I'm assuming this, so you can call it out if you think it's completely off. But I would think... I mean, I studied construction at university. I was supposed to get into construction. I didn't get into it. But you'd think that most construction people, they get a lot of them do get paid well. Yep. Some don't. But you'd think that a lot of them just spend their money stupidly. Like they would come out of their careers, tradies especially, not with a lot of assets. That may be incorrect. Do, do you, A, do you think there's truth to that? And B, what prompted you to start investing in property? 80 to 90% of construction workers piss their money away. <laughs> You know, everyone's got the newest Malou. They all drink too much. I mean, when you're working that many hours, you're away from your family, it's depressing. So a lot of the guys drink a lot, they gamble. You know, you've got a lot of spare time when you're driving, people gamble heaps. So, you know, everyone's not overly educated, like a lot of the laborers and so on. Um, and I wasn't, I was, didn't went to uni, I never had a degree. I made $300,000 a year and I never had a degree. You know what I mean? It's, there's a lot of people like that. So a lot of people just piss their money away. Like when you're making that kind of money year after year, you just think it's endless. Mm. I've always wanted to get into property when I was younger, but I was too busy partying when I was, you know, my 18s to 25. Um, always thought about it. So as soon as I had the money coming in, that's the first thing I wanted to do. Plus I was really handy on the tools for my job. So it kind of just all made sense. You, and so I'm assuming you were renovating the apartments as 100%, well? 100%, yeah. Every property I've ever bought, I've renovated myself. Wow. The good thing about construction is every single trade is on site every day. So I just got an electrician, a plumber, everyone from site, paid them cash after work to come and help me. So it was pretty good for that. I like that. And so well, maybe not the cash part, let's just... <laughs> Until the tax department. So what about, you just bought something recently, I know, for a client, a subdivision. Yep. Have you ventured out now completely with your clients that you're buying investments for where they're looking for renos, some of them are doing a strict buy and hold. Some are doing subdivision. Mm -hmm. are, are, you, are, you, are you now working with a whole mixed bag of clients? Yeah, I, I now focus 95% on investors. And my thing is buy something 60s, 70s, 80s with value add potential. So something that can be renovated so you can increase your equity and something that can be subdivided. Not everyone subdivides. It's only a small you know, number of people that want to go down that path because you need the cash take some time some people think it's stressful I, I help them with that but some people still don't want to do it but I still like to buy properties that can be renovated at value 100 percent. yeah I agree with that even if it's a small like cosmetic pa cosmetic, paint yeah. or just yeah. something basic you can spend ten thousand dollars it's crazy what the difference what you can do in terms of the upside yeah I agree with that it's a, that's a big one a lot of people think they need to do these structural renos spend yeah. all this money you don't need to no you can for 30 grand you can do a house, like, you know, it's paint in your kitchen, bathroom. There's, things are cheap these days. Um, it's not that hard to do. There's so many companies out there that can help you do it. It's, it's not what it used to be. How are you enjoying the new life? Because it's not easy starting any business, especially being a buyer's agent. You know, it's not just super easy. It's got its challenges. But I also think with the challenges of a buyer's agent when you join the career, there's so many wins outside of the financial gain, like the freedom and the flexibility and the autonomy, that it outweighs a lot of the, the other stuff, which can be maybe not earning money as quickly as you wanted to. What's been your experience? The hardest part was going from 300K to not. <laughs> that, that's the big adjustment. But I, you know, I built up my portfolio over the years to a point where I could I could do it. I could, I could quit my job and I could have taken two, three, four years off if I really wanted to. So I kind of had that flexibility, which is good. 
but the time that I have now to do what I want to do is unbelievable, man. I get to wake my kids up, have breakfast. I could have lunch. I can have dinner with them. I can t block out days. I could work two, three, four days a week. Like you work as hard as you want to. Um, obviously, the harder you work, the more money you make. But the flexibility of the of running the business is unbelievable. You, you get to understand work-life balance. 100%. It's just life, not just work. Yeah, you, you get to understand that whole integration. Because when you, like when you, like what you're doing, I'm assuming underground, doing a large commute on the way to work and then spending time underground, then driving home. I mean, there's not much of the life and the balance. There's a lot of work. I did six days a week too, for seven years. So Sundays is my only day and I mean, Sunday, you just need to rest. So my only real day outside was Sunday because Melbourne's, you know, pretty cold in winter. <laughs> it's pretty dark. So I literally woke up, went to work in the dark at five in the morning, got home at seven o'clock at night in the dark. It's pretty, you know, pretty intense. Must feel like you're, you're reborn now. <laughs> don't feel like, I honestly don't feel like I've worked a day since I quit my job. You said earlier that which I can understand, it was not easy walking away from a 300K income, which is big, to zero. What really prompted you? Like, what was the key thing that prompted you to make that decision? Because that, 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 you need a lot of courage and you've got a family, you've got you know, mm. two young, beautiful kids. What was um, it? I did your course six months before I quit my job. I was doing both, Just trying to. It was very hard when you're underground, you got no reception. <laughs> Pretty hard to have meetings when you rock up in your trading gear. And you're trying to say you're a buyer's agent, doesn't really work. Um, I actually broke my hand. I just had surgery the other day and I had three months off. So I was like getting work cover, three months off. And I, as soon as I broke my hand, I was like, that's it. I'm never going back to construction again. It's like, I, it happened. I was in the hospital and that was it. I was like, I'm not going back. What was it? Like, I understand it could have just been like an intu something intuitive or outside of the hand. Like, and that, that might have been, I'm assuming, just that, that icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. Was there, was there a moment or did something happen where you were just like... The, the day, I think it was like June 15th, <laughs> I actually remember this, I was listening to the podcast of you on um, SPI. That's when we spoke, I did the course. That's the day I decided, that's it, I'm quitting. But I, I couldn't just quit because obviously I have a family, I have mortgages. So my plan, my plan was to finish the next year in March, but then the hand happened in uh, September, October and that was when it was done. So I'd already made the plan, it was just my, I had to plan it properly, so I, I couldn't just quit one day. The, I planned it, but then it just happened a bit sooner than it was meant to. It's awesome, it's yeah. awesome. And, and that's, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm, that, my, my deeper intention with what I do with the program is not just to become a buyer's agent, that's a, an output of the service we provide, but it's yeah. to activate change. 100%. And so uh, it, it's awesome to hear that uh, you were inspired and and you, you are an action taker, so yeah. I'm not surprised you kind of <laughs> threw the towel in like you did. So now you're running living property, mm -hmm. you're focusing primarily on investment, yep. you're buying in a few different states. Every state except the Northern Territory. Yeah, we, we don't, I, I don't know any buyers agents in the Northern Territory. Yeah, maybe I don't know why. No offence to the Northern Territory, but... And I believe it's the hardest state to get your licence anyway. Really? Yeah, and okay. there's no, not many agents there. Okay. Um, are you doing any principal place of residence purchasing? I was, but I've gone to the investment. I've, I was finding um, being a marriage counsellor <laughs> too much <laughs> with the principal place of residence, too much, a lot of emotion, a lot of indecision. I found it quite difficult, not difficult, but it was just, when you've got someone dealing with, let's make some money, this is the numbers with an investment property, this is your return, this is what I want, this is what you're going to get, simple. It's everyone is on the same page, but when you're talking with someone buying a home for the rest of their life, it's an amazing feeling buying it for someone and being involved in it because mm. you're in their life for the rest of their life. But to get there with some people is very difficult, especially when husband and wife, most of the time, aren't on the same page, but they don't tell you. You know what I mean? You think at first it's all good, and then as time goes on, you realize, hang on, these two aren't agreeing on this. And it just, it was very draining. So I, uh, yeah, I've gone to the investment model and I'm, I'm loving it. I, I mean, I always say there's a lot of emotion in investment, I still believe, mm -hmm. different emotion. Sidestepping, what's, you've obviously, the, you've, you've done a lot in terms of transition with your career in life. What's your definition of success now? Fre time, freedom. 
I mean, you need money, money's great, but it's time to see, watch my kids grow up, to be mentally fit, physically fit, have time to, I'm training for a marathon at the moment, it takes hours of running, of stretching, of yoga, of fitness. It's pretty hard to do that when you work 12 hours a day. So that is all in my actual daily calendar. I have my running, my yoga, my meditation is in my calendar, so I cannot book that in for any clients or anything. It's all in there. I couldn't have, no chance I could do that before. Yeah, I mean, you, we were talking earlier, you came from Melbourne today, you had a, a coaching session with someone today or for the whole day, and you said you got up at what time? 3.30 to go for a run. <laughs> to actually go for a run? A run at 3.30, ran to the gym, trained, did some yoga, caught a plane here at 6 a.m. Unbelievable. Yeah. Health is important, and we were talking about this, as for me, I mean, Number one. Number one. You have to be able to serve yourself or you can serve others. Exactly. And time. Talking about time, I mean, time is the most Im important thing on this planet. It's the only thing you can't buy more of. Yeah. And so it's just nice that you're, you're valuing it more and you appreciate it more and you're more aware of it. I mean, I, I, I feel like I am to an extent, but at times I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people who are stuck in jobs that really don't need to be there, it's a true... Sometimes it's a, to me, it's a true definition. They don't appreciate time enough. I don't, I don't understand a lot of people that, like, I don't think they've hit that aha moment where they're like, you don't need to be here. What are you doing? Like, it's just the, the rat race. Like they're stuck in that habit. It's like to break that habit is so hard for so many people. Like how many people are unhappy? Like probably 90% of the world are unhappy with what they do. It's, it's crazy. So to break that habit was quite confronting to actually do it but you know when you walk through the the row of mirrors on the other side it's amazing how have you changed now since you've stepped into this new role as a business owner working in property building relationships serving clients uh, getting your time back more freedom seeing your kids spending more time in the sun repairing your mitochondria you no know, just getting healthier how have you changed every way possible now much more calm, relaxed, much healthier. I feel, I feel I'm like I'm 25 again. You know, I'm nearly 40. It's crazy that <laughs> I feel younger than I've ever felt, fitter, healthier, um, pretty much in every way. The most important thing is just to get to hang out with my kids. Like when you when you have kids and then you're at work all the time, you never get to see them. It's like what's the point in having them? Like I don't get why people have kids if they're going to be at work all day because. When they grow up, you're, gonna, you're not going to get that time back again when they're young. It's an interesting one. I mean, I don't have kids. I've got cats. <laughs> and sometimes I feel guilty, seriously, just not spending enough time with them. Mm. Uh, and I get that. And, and, that, and I, I would feel guilty if I had kids and I couldn't spend time with them. It'd be tra That's challenging nice. not seeing them grow up and being there with them. And so, I mean, but, you know, some people could argue and say, well, we have to work. But I think we've all got choices with how, what we decide to do with our time and how we work and how we make money and... We've all got choices, right? Exactly. And then, you know, throwing away my TV was probably the biggest thing for me to do the shift because I used to go home, watch TV to zone out and I wouldn't think. I'd just be sitting there just, just watching some show on Netflix or whatever. Got rid of my TV and started just reading and educating myself and that just opened up my health, my fitness, like my mind, everything just changed. As soon as I kind of switched it off from the rest, what the rest of the world are kind of doing, like I just stop caring about what everyone else is doing and just solely focused on that. Throwing away the TV to create the shift. I, I, I haven't had a TV. I can't even remember how long was the last time I had it. owned a TV, mm. but I completely agree with you. Mm. The TV is a game changer. Yeah. People say no devices before bed and all, no yeah. this and no that. It's no devices. <laughs> Throw the TV out because the TV is brainwashing people. It's it's, there's a lot of garbage on there. It's negative. The media is all is designed to program us a certain way. So the, the more we can get it away from that, the better. And I and I think the TV can create dramatic shifts because it's a it's a distraction that we don't have. Mm -hmm. And so we may pick up another distraction, which may be reading a book, which I think is a better distraction mm -hmm. at times if it's a distraction. But I really do believe what you just said is that TV can create the shift. Hundred percent. It's like. A so many people say that I have no time. I can't, I can't do that. I've got no time. But then they'll watch seven episodes of Desperate Housewives. It's like, well, you found four hours to do that. <laughs> I'm sure you could have been doing something else. It seems like you, you're moving with new flow. I mean, I didn't know you very well before. We've obviously formed a friendship since um, you've become a buyer's agent. 
and you've, you've, you're transforming a lot daily, which is, is great to see and you look a lot happier. When you see someone, like whether it's a friend or not a friend, who is not really enjoying what they're doing with their work, like, do you empathise with them? Like, do you speak to them about it or you just sit there and just let them walk through it? Or No, I try. I try my hardest to... First, it was everyone thought I was crazy. Like, why would you quit a job where you get paid so well? And then it was, first you're crazy, and then it was, shit, I wish I had done that. <laughs> so, man, you can only you can only try and help help your friends. Like this, you know, why don't you try it? But people are scared. People are scared to to make the shift, or they have excuses. I'm like, well, you can do both. You don't have to be a buyer's agent. This can be any business or any hobby or side hustle you want to do. But then people give you the, I have no time. So, or they drink too much, or they have their escapes. It's like, all you can do is try and help them and it's their life. So you kind of don't want to spend too much energy on other people because then it's taking away from yourself. But 100%, if I see friends that are unhappy, I just lead by example and just keep living the dream. Yeah, great, mate. Listen, it's been awesome hearing about your shift and the journey from circus to I don't know the order, but hospitality, fitness, construction, and then having the courage to get out, especially of a basement where you're earning 300K to really follow a deeper purpose for yourself. Uh, well done. It's been inspiring to see you do this and live this, and it's awesome. So I appreciate uh, our discussion. So thank you. Thank you very much. Where can people find you? LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Oliver Jackson, buyer's agent, uh, www.livingproperty.com.au. Okay, too easy. Well, thank you. All right. Great to chat. So there's a story for you. And whether you've got a diverse background like Ollie or you don't, it can be very challenging to make change and shift career. And change is not easy. Uncertainty is not easy because we all want to know what exists in the future. But sometimes we don't. We just need to lead with our intuition. And I always think a good gauge at Sunday night is... is if you're happy on Sunday night and looking forward to work, it's a very good litmus test. It's a very simple test to realize, are you actually happy with what you're doing? So if you're sitting there and you're actually not happy with what you're doing on Sunday night, whatever it is you may want to do, you may want to start considering changing your career. And as Ollie was saying, and as we were discussing around time, you can't buy time. We can buy a lot of other things, but we can't buy time. It's very valuable and we really need to use it wisely. So check out Ollie, livingproperty.com.au, national investment model. See you next week.